So uh, um, when I was asked to, to give a series of lectures about uh, type 3 approach to surfactants, so I asked myself whether I should talk about the Tomita Takitaki theory, so all the serious type 3 things. I thought that the answer is to be no. What do you really want to hear is not a type, really type 3 approach, but sector approach, right? Yeah. So, um, well, actually, so the sector approach was developed in the, well, its origin was in uh, quantum field theory, uh, algebraic approach of the quantum, quantum field theory. And uh, once you are admit to just w one thing about the type 3 factor, namely, so any, any two non-zero projection of a type 3 factor equivalent in the sense of Murray von Neumann, then, then that's it. You don't really need to use the other, other deep stuff like the like theory of the type 3 factor. And in a sense, so the theory, sector theory works even for sister algebras, once you have that property. Anyway, so for, for, for example, for the Kunz algebra O2, it's a famous sister algebra, not von Neumann algebra, it's a pa purely infinite sister algebra. And it's known that uh, the K0 of the Kunz algebra, algebra O2 is trivial, meaning that uh, every non-zero projections are mutually equivalent. And the sector theory works perfectly for O2. So I decided to, at least at the beginning, start with a more general setting, say, sister algebra setting. Then I don't really need, I, I cannot really use Tomita Takisaki theories. I don't need to explain that. So Bohm introduced the notion of index for subfactors of type 2 1 factor. And uh, you, you've already seen that uh, trace preserving conditional expectation plays a crucial role. So, but when you start with the uh, inclusion of factors, type 3 factors, say, then there is no trace. Then what can you do? Well, you have to assume something else from the beginning. That condition, existence of the conditional expectation. Let L and B be sister algebra. So I start with the sister algebra. Then, uh, <coughs> positive linear map. Positive linear map E is a conditional expectation. So it's a, uh, okay, so B is a subalgebra of A, so it's a, uh, A is a BB bimodule, and say, E should be a BB bimodule map. So maybe so you have this property. For B1, B2, and B, and A in that way. And so since I already assumed <coughs> this is a positive mass, so it's unitary <coughs> enough. So this preserve, E preserve the unit. So, so this is the definition of the well, general conditional expectation. You don't need to assume the existence of trace. Then. And uh, by the way, it's well known that I told me about seven, so this is the same as a uh, normal projection. In Van Aha, let's say. But it's deep seven. Let's, let's okay, take this as uh, our definition of the conditional ex uh, experience. Does E1 equals one follow from the bimodule property? Because it's, a, it's a positive map. Positive map and uh, it's unitary, so it's normal. Always normal. No, in, in that case, you just put the. Uh, no, you are one to be a positive. Sure. Oh, so far. 
further question? No, no, no. I thought even it was one of the consequential bimodal properties. Ah, not really. No. no. If you take A equal to 1, B2 equal to B, don't you find that E of B equal to? That E raised oh. to B2 may be the identity oh. that follows. Oh. Only that B. Oh, 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 oh. wait, wait, uh, wait. No, it's still. So only on the range of, on E of B is valid. Oh, this is a, yeah, no, no, no. Okay, okay. Uh, so if you, okay, consider multiple of E, still it is a BB by multiple, but it's not unitary. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so this is the easy example. So, uh, let G be a finite group. Let's consider the action. Then, uh, so you take you take the average <coughs> over G in the point sense. So you have a G action here. So you plug. This map, and this is a map from uh, is a map from yeah. from A to the fixed point out, which already appeared in both talk. Then, is a conditional case. It's easy to see. Ah, uh, it's easy to see that this is a positive map. It's a okay. It's a linear combination. What well, positive uh, convex combination of positive map. So it's positive, and it's unitary. Okay, convex combination of unitary map is unitary. And uh, yes, it's, it's clear, it's BB by positive. So this is a typical example, and uh, let me give you another example, which is kind of zero of this situation. I told you with B equal to the fixed point. Yes, yes, B. Or AB. So, Let's consider a different situation, that's a cross product. So, so still alpha is G action. Then you can produce a new sister algebra of all my model, or finally sister algebra actually. So this is a sister algebra generated by A and a copy of uh, the regular representation. A copy of regular representation. Satisfy the following condition. So this is a universal system algebra satisfying with generators and the relation. So this is a cross product. Then so by definition, any element here have expansion, unique expansion. Sometimes it's called a Fourier expansion. Here x g is in a. Then you can consider this map. So sending this to the delta g element. So let's call this map, uh, say, E1. Then this is again a conditional expectation. So E1 is a conditional expectation. So again, it's easy to see that E1 satisfies this condition. Right. So these are typical examples. And in a sense, E and E1 are dual to each other. I'll explain what it really means. Right. So let me give you. Okay, let's consider this situation. So E is given. So A and B are sister algebras. E B is a sister subalgebra of A, and uh, they they share the common unit. And A is a conditional expectation. Then we say that E of uh, uh, 
in the fireplace. If there exists a finite subset, you run u2 to un in A, satisfying the following property that for any any x has a foreign expansion. And since A is A is a C star algebra and E is a star map, so if you take the star of this equation, then you get another another equation automatically. So whenever E has such a system, such an element, such an element, then uh, you say that E is of index finite type. And actually, you call this a basis. This is basis. Uh, strictly speaking, I should say that it's basis of A over B with respect to, to E. I should say something like that, but I just say that uh, this is a basis for, for E. Or strictly speaking, I should say, Kim's map of this. Right. Then, uh, actually, uh, well, probably it's. Uh, so Paul is not here. <laughs> if he is he, 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 he here, then uh, he would say that it's not fair to assume the, the existence of basic from the beginning. <laughs> but uh, well, actually, I can talk about the uh, index, the index of uh, conditional expectation of a type three factor, without referring to the, this basis. But uh, this is the easiest way to to get basic expansion. Well index, basic expansion, and so on and so on, algebraic construction. So let me assume it's the existence of basic from the beginning. Then, uh, OK, one easy fact about this basis is the following. So this number, uh, not really a number, it's an L of the C stars of A. So, this is a always belongs to the center of A. And in fact, it does not depend on the choice of you. <coughs> so the definition of the, this terms of, of index finite type is just the equidistance of one basis. And in general, so there are many, many different basis for one conditional expectation. Yes? So, sorry, can you just briefly, for those two examples, I can imagine the basis for one of them would be something like a lambda e. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what's the one for the top one? Well, is there a name? in general, Actually, the top one doesn't have a basis in general. Oh. When a and b are factors and alpha, well, a and b are factors, then there is a good basis. But, the, but, uh, but this is okay. This is really nice thing. But uh, for that, then that 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 that's just the existence. You can show the existence, so but, you, can show the existence. but you don't really have a canonical basis. And for the NLC star algebra, then you actually, so there is an example where, okay, this E doesn't have a basis. It's, it's related to the uh, freeness of the action for C stars. It's very subtle. Right. So, so the bottom, sorry, just so that I've got the bottom example, E is always a finite type. Right. The top one, not necessarily. It depends on the property of our. For general C 
this algebra for factor distribution. Okay. Right. Ah, so this is a statement, and it's really an easy computation. So. Well, this is a. Oh, let 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 me prove it. It's really easy computation. So assume there is another basis. Assume this is also a basis. Then, uh, so let's try to compute this. Ah, yes, we want to know this does not depend on the choice of this. But uh, well, we, we, we showed, so, so this statement contains two, actually two statements. First, this is in the center, and the, the second one is that uh, this doesn't depend on the choice. So let's try to prove the two statements simultaneously. So let's so we compute this by by expanding this part using VJ. Okay. So and for that we use this part. By VJ. Uh, yes, VJ. Right. Now, uh, so I should put some page here. Now I change the, the order of some mention here. And here I use Bit, uh, something's wrong. Star. Yes. Then I use the basis property of UI here. Then uh, I end up with, uh, yes, this. Right. So you just look at the, the first time and the last time. If you put x equal to one, then it means that it gives you that okay, this sum is the same as that sum is here. So, so this element doesn't depend on the choice of the basis. And once you know that, then this this equality means that this sum is in the center of a. So. It's a really easy computation. And the, actually, the, the idea was, <coughs> I, mean, I think it's, uh, well, it's, I should, I should say, Pim Sunakopan, also the uh, idea of Watatani is that uh, to define an uh, index for general exclusion, then uh, let's, let's do so this number. So we call this the index of E. Uh, Watatani. So W means, well, so Watatani proposed that uh, to define the index of general inclusion by using the basis in this way. So I put W. And uh, I have a few remarks, of course. So when A and B, say A and B are two factors, and uh, E is a trace preserving function expectation, then this, well, first of all, so this is a central element. So when B, A is a, cent a, is a factor, then it's scalar. Then this definition, of course, coincides with the Bond's original definition. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I should sh show that uh, there is the exists a basis, but that's what Pim's and Popa did. What does that mean? Oh, sorry. 
So Pim uh, okay. Popper showed that there is a, always a basis and uh, this number coincides with Jones index. And uh, yes, okay, already Jeff just asked me about this. Uh, in, uh, this, this is only the finite index case. What? This is only the finite index case. Yes. Ah, uh, of course. I uh, yeah yeah. So you can you can relax this condition a little bit you, if you allow a series of elements. So this is just a finite set in the definition. But if you allow a series of definitions, then uh, yeah, sometimes you get a basis in just in, in the ca case of uh, infinite index in the usual thing. Yes, in that case, this number is. Right. So, so in this example, in this case, then uh, it's clear that uh, this is a base. This is a basis, and the index in this sense, okay, in this sense is. Uh, This is nothing but a cardinal view. Right. And uh, we are, they already asked about this situation a bit, bit uh, subtle. But when A and B are factors, then there is a basis. Using the fact that actually, so this action is a second view action of something, then you get a basis. Again, you get the same number for index. So this is a one way of defining index for general case, but uh, there is another way that, that's uh, what the PIMS and the Popper propose. So I, I'll mention it briefly. Uh, right. So there's another easy lemma. So if we just is a conditional expectation from A to B and where is the basis, then you have this inequality. So this one. So since this is just a central element, set norm and identity. So you regard this as a map, linear map from A to a itself. B is a, B is a sub algebra of A, so you can regard E as a map from A to A. So it makes sense. Then, actually, this is a positive. Positive map. <coughs> That's what uh, Pimus and, Pimus and the Popper first showed. Actually, this is also easy and nice argument. So to get used to basis, well, argument with basis, then uh, I think it's, it's nice to have B with this proof. So in this case, how can I show this? So let's assume x is an element of A, then uh, we have a P, well, the following different uh, expansion. So every positive element of A can be written as an x, x star. So let's complete this. Okay. And here, you have a nice matrix, operator matrix. So. 
Um, so let's, let's, let's consider this matrix, operator matrix first. So this is in uh, pair. The visual term to be changed from UA star to UG? Ah, right, right, right. Yes, this is the right order. Yes. Yeah, this is the right order. Right. So let's consider this matrix. Then here, what appears here is that uh, Okay. Right? Yes, yes. So if you consider the ij component of this matrix, V star T, then this is nothing but uh, ui star D. So let's con constitute, uh, compute the other product, V V star. Nothing but uh, UI UI star. So this is the uh, index. Right. So this computation shows that the norm of this matrix is this. The norm of this matrix is. Uh, Is nothing but the index. Of e. And since this is a well, clearly positive matrix, so we have this thing called it. And times item. So using this inequality. In general, you cannot really reverse them, but uh, say in a good situation like uh, when A and B are, say, simple system algebras, or when A and B are factors, then, so if this number is finite, then so there, there is there is a basis. If this basis and these two number coincide, equal. Well, in these two cases, then this is a not a, well. So then uh, the center of A is trivial. So this is a scalar. So the two number coincide. So, so there be an inference in the what? You mean if the proof of our index is finite, then the other thing. Ah, okay, all right. I should write it this way. Yeah. So under under either this condition or that condition, then if the probabilistic index is finite, then it implies the existence of base. You see, and the coins the two numbers coincide. And this requires a proof. It's, uh, it's not really simple. But I skip it. It's not a really point of this series of lectures. What does P stand for? P probabilistic or P Mr. Napova? Whichever. P -p -p. What? P P P. P P P, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to make Spring happy. I should be. <laughs> any, any. Actually, two and factor is automatically simple sister algebra. Actually, factor is also a simple sister algebra. But two infinity or B of H are not simple sister algebra. Still, that's it. So that's the same thing as saying if the index is infinite to the, the, the star. There's no constant probability constant 
So the, the, the easy one is uh, with what I already proved, okay. or so <laughs> I right. proved. So existence of basis implies a Pim's not of any group. Sister algebra, that must but uh, for yeah, general, for general sister algebra, or well, well, general say von Neumann algebra, Pym's knight proper inequality does not assure the existence of a finite basis. If you allow a sequence, then uh, the equity. So since I mainly have mainly work on type 3 factors, so I don't really need to distinguish these two. Right. So, yeah. So, are there any questions up to here? Is everything clear? Good. So now, I should talk about the basic construction. Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, well, in the case of 2-1 factor, then it, it's a uh, pim snap offer. Yeah, no, no, you need a simple system. Simple system algebra, uh, that's my own reason. Yeah, but very careful to see that. Uh, it's, uh, it appears in Kreb uh, Journal, yes. Pimpson and Popper use the semi continuity algorithm. Not the semi continuity. Hmm. Two norms. Yeah. What do you use for? Actually, I use the. Actually, I. There is a paper of uh, French people, three French people. Oh, you're right. Abe, yeah. Abe, yeah. They treated the general von Neumann algebra case. Yeah. So. Then I use the second view argument. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So any relation with the CV norm? Sorry? CV norm? Completely bounded norm. Uh, I think, in, well, I think the positivity is crucial here. Right, so Bon already talked about basic construction. Since it's very important, and this is the first lecture of my side. I, I keep at least this lecture very elementary, so I start with well, basic construction. I mean, I'll give you the details of basic construction for the general case. All right, so the situation is this. So I already assumed this situation. There is a condition expectation and also basis. So before you before you enter this room, I said that if you you are here, then uh, it's not. For, you might say that it's not fair to assume the existence of basis at the beginning. But uh, once once you assume the existence of basis, then uh, I I don't really need to talk about Tomita Takisaki theory at all, at all. So everything is algebraic once you assume the existence of basis. So, well, today still I'm, I'm in the sister algebra setting, so, so, okay. The basic idea is of course the same uh, as Vaughn already told this morning, yesterday. But, uh, okay, I'll give you the detail. So, since A is a, okay, write B module, okay. So, so I use a different no notation for A as a write B module. And I also use this. So for element, well, just, just to, uh, to uh, avoid the confusion, so I use a different notation for it. A. This is not only 
A module, but it's so called the Hilbert A module. Namely, so there's a nice B valued in a product. So you can introduce a B valued in a product. So this is a B value. So it looks like an ordinary in a product, but uh, this is not a scalar. It's it's in B. And the pim popper inequality shows that we have this. Well, it's equivalence of norms. This is nothing but the premise of upper inequality. So, this shows that uh, at the Banach space, so. Okay, as a normal space, this is already a Banach space. So with respect to this norm. So this is a standard norm for uh, Hilbert module. So this is the Banach space. And so, well, and this is so-called, what so-called uh, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert B module, Hilbert system module. And there is a nice theory about the Hilbert system module. Namely, so you can consider a kind of bounded operators of, say, B, okay, bounded operator with an adjoint operator. Then, then you get a sister algebra. Uh, so let me define this space, this algebra. So this is a, is a set of T. is a bounded operator on this Banach space, such that there exists a some bounded operator T star, it's a joint. Such that, right, T star A1, A2 is equal to well, I didn't put E here, sorry. It's confusing. I should put it here. Uh, okay, this is not. This is the so-called the set of adjointable operators. And actually, this condition automatically assures that T is a right, right B module map, automatically. So any element here is a right B module map. And there is a nice theory about uh, Hilbert system module. It says that this is, again, a C star, automatically nice C star. And in our situation, when okay, we start with von Neumann algebra, then actually this is a von Neumann algebra structure automatically. It's called a self dual double star module. So, yeah. 
self developed W star module. I think Pashke, Pashke introduced it. Yeah. Right. Then, as I've already told you, so there is a natural, obvious inclusion here. Namely, by left multi multiplication. And also, so the condi conditional expectation E itself belongs here, but I, I don't want to use the, the well, I want to use this notation for the conditional expectation. This is so-called Jones projection. And they, well, they satisfy the obvious relation here. So this is a very easy computation. Right. And uh, well, I, I erase the definition of basis, but uh, the, the definition of the, the basis I introduced is nothing but the following equation. So we actually have this equality. So this is nothing but the, you know, writing in a different way of the, the definition of the basis property. So if you apply the left hand side to say eta A, then you immediately see that it's, it's identity. Right, and uh, actually, so it's really nice to have this, this equation. So this gives you everything. So everything is algebraic due to this, this equation. So, and the important, so the most important, well, statement along this line is that, uh, so, so let's call this, so this is a bit complicated, so let's call this A1. Then the point of the basic construction is that uh, this is nothing but, so this is, well, since I use a theory of C star, it looks like, um, but, you know, analysis is involved, but it's not the fact. It's not really the case. So this is, Determined algebraically. So, so I'm going to show this. This is a really important property. So it's as at least as a linear space of say A by modules, then this is nothing but the module tensor product over B. So I think uh, my goal today is to show this. And then uh, once you get that, then you get a dual conditional expectation automatically, well, almost automatically. I, I'll show you the real meaning of this. But, uh, Okay. okay. Again, I'll show you a very easy computation. So for any T in A1, we have this foreign expression. So T can be expressed as this. Say T I, E, uh, U I, right. U I or U star, star, it's star. Where T 
pi is determined by this relation. Uh, yes. So since you know, you don't really need to take completion or anything. So this is other set. Then uh, our Hilbert module is just A itself, so it makes sense, right? Well, this is really easy. Oh. Well, you, you just compute this, okay? Then using the base property and so on, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is well, probably the other way is more, much more easy. So let's start. Let's compute this. Then you, what you do is you expand A by using the module property, uh, basis property. Uh, yes. And since, okay, this is a right B module, so, and T is a right B module map. So you have, say, I. And uh, yes, you can make this, right? Because T is a right module map, right B module map. Then what you get is that, uh, say, and this is nothing but uh, yes, yes, e ui star applied to eta a. Okay. Yeah. So this this equality shows that t is nothing but this element. Right. So having this lemma, then uh, I can I can make sense of this equality. <coughs> so there are two natural maps here. So let's consider this, so, okay, just, a, just algebraic B module tensor products. Then, by using the uh, universality of the tensor product, we have the following map. Since the Jones projection commute with uh, B, any element of B, so, and by using the universality of the tensor product, and we have a linear map here. Okay. Actually, it's a, a bimodular map. Right. And uh, what I meant here is that this map is linear isomorphism. And namely, the inverse is given by, by this formula. Precisely. So given T in A1, then what you consider is the following Ti tensor B Ui. So this is an element of A tensor A. And the theorem says that. So this is a isomorphism, linear isomorphism. With, uh, well, this very expressed inverse. Actually, uh, we already seen the one direction of the proof. 
Curitiba. So this is a, so starting from T, you go here. U I. Sorry. Can I change the U I star? U I star, yes. U I star. Right. So starting from T, so you you send T by this map here. Then you send by phi. Then you what you get is this, right? So this is the identity. This is already done. And I think the other direction is also easy. So you start with an element like this, and then yeah, it's. it's it's just a few line computations, so I omit it. Right. So this means that the basic construction is, well, nothing but it. just a module tensor product over B. So the universality of the module tensor products, then you know, we now we can introduce the dual, say, operator valued weight. Not con well, first you have to go through the operator valued weight. And uh, using that, then we can introduce the dual conditional expectation. So, uh, so using this result, so definition. We can introduce this map. So starting from A. The map from A1 to A, which send X, E, Y to X, Y. And this is so-called a dual operator valued weight in the literature, in the type 3 subfactor literature. And this is very defined because A1 is an isomorphic to module tensor product. Right. And uh, actually, the Kosaki's idea is that okay, if you compute this, then you know that this is one UI, UI star. This is one. And uh, then uh, by definition, you get this. And this is our definition of index, of the index of E. So the real story about the subfactors of type 3 factors is uh, the following. So this thing, this dual operator valued weight, was constructed by, by essentially by Hagerup. Hug up theory of the operator value the weight with a, say, J operator. Then Kosaki noticed that in the case of type 2, 1 factors, then this number is nothing but, well, as you can see, the index of the factor. So Kosaki's approach is that, uh, well, let's, so let's take this as a definition of the index. Then starting from this formula, he developed the uh, the theory of subfactors, of type C factors. That's what Kosaki did. So starting from the fact that this is a finite, then you can, you can sh show that there exists a basis and so on, so basic extension and so on. So. That's what Kosaki did. But uh, now I reversed the order. So from the beginning, I assume the existence of basis. Then no, this becomes a theorem. Right. So, but uh, this is not a conditional expectation. It's not normalized. So we want to normalize it and to get a conditional expectation. And actually, it's possible. And, but for that, I should remark this. 
So this is actually a positive map. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, this is positive. So since it's, well, once you know that it's positive, then you automatically know that it's bounded, right? The norm is bounded by, norm we had is bounded by this element, the norm of this element. Actually, from the definition, it's not at all clear whether this is positive or not, right? So you need to show something. And uh, actually, so uh, what we show is that, well, not only this is positive, but uh, well, we show that this is positive. And it's enough. So we show this. And uh, OK. Every element, yes. Yeah, that's, that should be easy. Right. So every element x in A1 have the following expression. Oh, yes. That's what uh, we've already seen. So let's consider this. Then this is uh, ij, xy, yi, ah, yes, yi star. Oh, sorry, yj star, e, xj star. And uh, well, we use almost the same trick as before. We, when we, sh we show that Here's a of inequality. So let's consider this part. Then, uh, well, as a matrix, this is a positive matrix. And since this belongs to B, so it commutes with this uh, projection. So as a matrix, we have this inequality. Uh, let's put E here. We have this inequality as a matrix. Uh, in, in this algebra, MN, MN, uh, so this is A1, yes. You see? So this is a positive element, and E, E, E is a projection committing with a positive element, so we have this inequality. So, using that, this fact, then uh, we get uh, yes. We get x x star is dominated by i j and uh, yes x i. Y, I, Y, J star, X, J star. And this is nothing but, this is nothing but E hat. Uh, X, X star. Right. So, well, from the definition of this map, it's not clear that whether this is positive or not is clear, but uh, by using this well, simply computation, you see that it's positive. So, definition, the dual conditional expectation so uh, since the dual operator by the weight is not not normal, so let's, we can normalize it. Then it's clear that, well, already here it's clear that E hat is a bimodule map. And since this index is a center of elements, so this is still a bimodule map. And we already, we saw that E hat is a positive map. 
So this is a E1 is also positive, and by thanks to this normalization, this is unitary. So E1 is a conditional ex expectation. And this is called a dual conditional expectation. Okay. I still have 20 minutes. Okay. It's more than enough. And the natural question is that, uh, what's, so we start from uh, the existence of a basis of E. So then we, we constructed, we, well, we show that, uh, well, there is a nice theory of a basic construction. We get a dual conditional expectation. So na the natural question is whether this is of, of index finite type or not. So can you guess the right formula for the index? Uh, the, the, the basis of E1, let's see, it's X. Very easy exercise. And uh, in fact, why well, it's easy computation, actually, which I don't really remember, <laughs> so I, should, I have to cheat, but anyway. So then, uh, OK, this is the right formula. Yeah? This is the basis. Base basis for the dual conditional expectation E1. Oh, it's easy computation. But this shows that so when okay, when this is a well in general this is a central element, but the when it is a scale. This is a scale. Then the index of the dual conditional expectation is again the same as the one let's compute it. Ui. So since uh, we assume that this is a scalar, so you, you can pull it out here. Star. And this shows that uh, it's the same as the uh, index <coughs> of E. Okay. So you get the same index for the dual conditional expectation. Right. So so is there any question up to here? So uh, starting from the existence of basis, then uh, everything is fine for sister algebra. But of course, what you are interested in is the case of von Neumann algebra. So let, so let me sh well, briefly explain the how uh, this construction is related to the, the case of the one in the von Neumann algebra. So when, let's assume A and B are forming algebra. Then usually you assume that E is a normal conditional expectation, meaning that uh, it is a right continuity property with some, some topology, say sigma weak topology, more precisely. Actually, it follows from the pim snap of inequality, but anyway, let's assume it. Then uh, for basic construction, what you usually do is the following. So you fix a one faithful normal state. Then you extend it by using E. 
So this is a phase normal, phase normal state of A. And uh, yes, then uh, you consider the GNS representation. And uh, for, to perform the basic construction in, for von Neumann algebras, then the usual definition is the following. So A, by using a DNS construction, so you represent A in this Hilbert space. Then what you do is that, uh, what you do is, right, Let's use this, this notation. You define the John projection this way. And the basic construction is by definition, say, uh, what's this? Okay, let's, let's, let's use this notice. Uh, so by definition, it's, uh, okay, weak closure of A, say pi A, the phone amount is generated by this set. And, well, it's easy to see that this is nothing but uh, the weak closure of this, this space. Right, but the point is that, in fact, well, you don't really need to take a weak closure here. The reason is the following. It's, well, you can repeat the same argument as I did by using a basis, that's one way, but, uh, well, actually it follows from the following computation. So, okay, once you have a Hilbert B module, then you consider this tensor product. Then you take the closure. Well, there is a natural inner product in, in this linear space. Then you take closure and you get a Hilbert space. And this is naturally identified with the GNS space of psi. And the identification is given by this map. Uh, okay. Say you identify this vector with the GNS vector, cyclic vector of psi. Then this identification makes uh, actually two Hilbert spaces are naturally identified. So on the okay, left hand side there is a natural representation A1 to B of and under this identification then this is identified with uh, B of H psi. And it's easy to see that, well, so this uh, actually pi comes from the, uh, the action of A1 on this left tensor component. So there is a natural action here. Then you can easily see that you can identify this with the GNS Okay, the restriction pi to a one, pi to a is nothing but a GNS representation under this identification, and uh, the image of 
this projection is nothing but a joint projection in that sense. And moreover, you can see that, uh, uh, first of all, so, well, uh, well, to see that this is already, okay, to see that this is a, okay, this space is already a von Neumann algebra, but I mean, that space without taking weak closure is a von Neumann algebra. Actually, it's enough to it's enough to show that uh, well, this is already a von Neumann algebra. But it's obvious because of this identification. Okay. From this identification, then the image of this B is already a von Neumann algebra. <coughs> Then, let's see, so this is M1. So M1 is, uh, since we have this, uh, okay. So let's suppress pi, it's, uh, let's suppress pi. Let me write this way. So this is, we know that this is one, so. You just uh, then this is U I E M one E J star. But uh, what from here, from this equation, well, this definition. So you already know that in this level. Well, well. At first point, of course, you have to take a weak closure, but since we know that this is just already a von Neumann algebra, so you, you don't really need to take a weak closure. So it means that it is in A1. So this is already, so A1 is already a von Neumann algebra. So everything is algebraic. So. Do you need the first term? Because of the, so? the sum being equal to one. Huh? Yeah. It is really take A is A E A, right? You don't need A plus A E A. Yeah, in the end, you see that you don't really need this, this component. Okay? But, uh, well, yes, of, from this definition, then a priori, this, you, you need this this term, but the facts, but this fact, so since this is the one, so you, you don't really need that term, yes. Right, so I have 10, 10 minutes left. Yeah. I need one really important technical, technical reserve called the push down lemma, and it will appear everywhere almost everywhere in uh, my next talks. Well, talks, yes, I guess some talks. So let me set that then. Huh? Push down then. So the situation is uh, as before. So we have a pair of sister algebras with a conditional expectation and a basis. So, so the push down, okay, push down lemma says the following. For any element x in A1, there is a unique element y in A satisfying, so this form. Ah, uh, yes. This is so-called the push-down lemma of uh, Pimsner-Popper. And uh, 
actually the point. The, so I think in the third talk, I'll present the sector, the sector theory in this setting. And uh, well, um, you might think that you really need a whole type three theory to, to talk about the sectors and so on and so on. But it's not really necessary. Once the only point is this push down map. I'll show that. To develop the type of a sector theory for type three factors, the only point is the push down lemma and the fact that, that uh, any two non zero projections are equivalent. That's all. So you don't really need parameter type -like theory and so on. That's why I'm, I'm doing everything algebraically today. So. And the proof is easy, really easy, because, well, uh, for the uniqueness, once you have, if, once you have this equation, once you have this inequality, then you apply the dual conditional expectation. This so it, this shows it why if there is such y then y should be uh, of this form. So this is a uniqueness part, and the equidistance part is also since we we have a basis so also easy because well, x can be expressed as a form. Uh, Ah, okay. AI. 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 So in A. Yes? You're showing the sister algebra situation. Yeah, 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 sister algebra. So the $1 index, you just win the inverse of the central element. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, it's inverse of the central element, but it's. Uh, it's the uh, it's larger than one. It's invertible. So, so x can be expressed in this form. So this product is uh, a i uh, yes p i d. So this shows that, uh, yes, so this part is y. Okay. So this is a push down rim. And I'll use it uh, in a crucial way. So, so I have five minutes left. So I'll talk about uh, what I am going to. So tomorrow, I, well, Tomorrow I, I will not give a talk. Yeah. Day after, okay. So I'm talk. I'll say a few words about uh, what I will do next time. So, so today I show I show that uh, well, starting from a conditional expectation with a basis, then there is a very nice theory of uh, index and basic construction and so on, so. On. But in the case of a type two one factor, they, they're the canonical conditional expectation, which is a trace preserving one. But in general, there is no canonical conditional expectation in that sense. But say, in the case of factors, say, when A and B are factors, or say, when A and B are simple sister algebras, there is also a canonical conditional expectation in a different sense, which is called the minimal conditional expectation. So the index really depends on the, the choice of conditional expectation, but there is a very special one which minimizes all the possible values of index. That's a minimal conditional expectation. But unfortunately, well, even in the case of a type two one factor, the minimal conditional expectation does not coincide with the trace preserving one in a very strange situation. In the, well, more precisely, in the case where the, the inclusion, the subfactor is not extreme, which Bond didn't talk about, then the two conditional expectations will not really coincide. 
And uh, well, I guess uh, there is a discussion about uh, which is better conditional expectation in that situation. Well, I should say that uh, well, non extremal inclusions are really strange ones. <laughs> We, we don't need to decide which is better. <laughs> but there is a point. There is a point which uh, I really want to stick to the minimal conditional expectation. Namely, the reason is the following. So it's a, it's a program versus index. Okay. Index and uh, say dimension, square root of index. So this is a, so uh, as you saw in an example, this is a quantity something like the, the cardinality of the group, finite group. But on the other hand, this is, the square root of the index is a, how to say, it's something like a dimension. So if you look at, uh, say, Wasserman type subfactors, well, which, well, probably I, I'll talk about at some more point. Then this corresponds to the dimension of the representation. So, well, I guess Bohm bon believes that this is a nat more natural than the other one. But uh, my, you know, I believe that uh, this is a better, this somehow yeah. behaves better. Yeah. And the, <laughs> right, that's also right. But uh, the point is that, okay, tomorrow I'll show that, uh, okay, when, okay, this inclusion is uh, not irreducible, so it's not, a, so the relative commutator is not a scalar. Then you want to, you want to compute the local index, namely, so you take a, say, partition of unity consisting of a minimal projection. I minimal minimal projection. Then you want to compute the index of this. So this is so called the local index. So it turns out that this this quantity behaves well. I mean, the, for, for local index, then the square root is better. The reason is that, so if you use the minimal conditional expectation to define the index of the factor, then you have this additivity property for the, for the square root of the index. And uh, index index well, doesn't have this addi additivity property. Well, on the right, you mean minimal index? Yeah, for the minimal index, yes, this is the case. On the left, they're automatically uh, minimal. Yeah, yeah, so in my definition, the, 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 this index is uh, the defined in terms of minimal conditional expectation. Yeah. For the minimal conditional expectation, then you have this additive property for the dimension and square root of the index. So on the left, you wouldn't make the minimal. Okay, I stop here.